Darren, thank you very much for your time, mate. It's, it's much appreciated. I think people are going to get a really interesting insight into the technology industry, but from a different viewpoint, right? Because everyone I've been speaking to so far has been in the channel, they've been in the vendor space, but you're actually on the opposite side. You're, you're a, an internal IT head. You, you're actually someone I've worked with in the past as well. So I think everyone's going to have a different viewpoint from your view of technology. So can you just introduce yourself and let everyone know why they should watch this video? Yeah, thanks, Carl. Uh, appreciate the uh, invite. Uh, my name is Darren Weston. So I currently work for a company called uh, Thomas Miller, which is an insurance mutual in the Fenchurch Street area of London in the insurance district. Been there about seven years now. Um, I've been in the IT industry myself for um, about 20 years now, um, doing various jobs at um, money brokers, again in London, um, and normally in the Wintel space, things like that. Um, my current role is infrastructure architect, stroke director as well. Um, so my main role at the moment is to help guide the business through the uh, roadmap for all our IT services in, in that area, really. Fantastic. And so wh where did your career, career start out, right? Um, so obviously it was 20 years ago. We don't need a day-to-day -day acquisition on, on how you've progressed, but what, what's, what's the journey look like? What's the kind of, where did you start and how have you got to where you are today? Well, I mean, it, it mostly happened by accident. And I think you'll probably find that from a lot of people. Um, I don't think a lot of people, certainly back in the era that I started in, sort of aimed at technology. It wasn't really the, the big thing that it was today. It was really technical toys for businesses. So it's a bit different than it is today. I started off not really knowing what I wanted to do and uh, went into London. If I'm honest, grabbed the first job I could, uh, not on a lot of money, working for a reconciliations department, uh, accounts reconciliations in a Japanese bank. Um, and I think at first I thought this can't be what I need to be doing for the next 50 years. Um, but what, where that went was I started developing Excel skills. I didn't really know much about technology at all. I started automating all their reports through macros and things like this. And uh, a role came up in the IT department, which one of the traders that I'd done work for pushed me towards um, and I went for it. And luckily enough, my boss at the time uh, encouraged me for the move and that sort of introduced me to the world of IT proper. I was there for about um, three and a half years in total before moving on. So that's really where I sort of came into IT. It was completely by accident. Technology was not my background. It wasn't um, the sort of accessible um, skill set and hobby that a lot of people do these days you know um so um yeah that's it that's fantastic and so obviously you spent a lot of time in internal it and that first role would like fit support based right so obviously that yeah. for a lot of people i've been interviewing it's been like the foundation right so a lot of the people i've spoken to started off in a first line support low second line moving their way up into infrastructure and project-based work and team management and things like that yeah. and everyone's kind of said that that engaging with the customer so your internal or external customer and feeling that pressure and that that desire that that you need to help them as fast as you can has really helped them in their career and understanding how to capture requirements and troubleshoot and have that logical uh, methodology on how you approach things yeah i think you know if, if i was to sort of give you an analogy and you know you, you see the sort of troubleshooters on the tv and the, one of the first things they suggest their upper management do is go on the floor and you know, I think this is the same in reverse. If you've not been on the floor, if you don't understand the lower cogs, wheels, challenges, and all those pressures, um, it's difficult if you, as you go through your career and progress to have real context and understanding and, and be empathetic with that side of the business. Um, I, cert I mean, I loved that aspect of my role. I loved knowing every individual in the company, good and bad, because there are always challenging personalities in any business. Um, and I, I learned so much from that because as someone who was doing basically desktop support in those first few years, you do come across people that are unreasonable, rude and all those things. And I enjoyed the challenge of turning them around. You know, mm. you know it's one of those things you could easily lose your temper if, if you're not um, got the right mindset and then, you know, you're going to lose your job or, or whatever it is. But, 
you learn to actually work with those people and try and bring them on board. And some of them take a while, but you, you get there. So yeah, hundred percent. I, I just love that engagement of those first few years of support. Perfect. And so what does it, what does a, a day in the life of Darren look like nowadays in your current role? Obviously at the moment with COVID, it's a little bit different to normal, uh, just being in my little office here at home. But the average day, I suppose, would be en engaging with um, management about where we're going and trying to build. A, every year I build a roadmap for the organisation in terms of technology. That's based on a lot of input. It's not just my technical wet dreams, if you like. Um, it's one of those things I try and it's about maintaining what we have and progressing us forward in the in in the direction the business wants to go. And I think it's one of the key things, I think, is IT people, there are IT people out there that just literally focus on the latest, greatest and best and always want to know what, which, which solutions best A or B. Uh, and my answer always with that is it depends. And everything has to come from the business. The business should be clear on its aspirations and its strategy and what it wants to achieve. And it's your job especially in that sort of, if someone's a BRM or an architect or something, you've got to convert that business of aspiration into a technical solution or technical direction that fulfills it without having to bore them with the detail yeah. of, of the lower level technology because they just don't want to know, to be honest. They just want to understand what they want to achieve. Yeah, it's, it's very common that... that it's me being on the, on the reseller side of the fence right and coming in and speaking to people like yourselves that we'll go into a meeting and any of my guys that come in the room if, if I ever hear them come out with a technology solution before they've captured the requirements mm. it's not a good situation to be in it's square peg round yeah. hole you're just trying to shoehorn a deal in potentially uh, it's not yeah. a good situation to be in it breaks down the partnership and the trust right at the end of the day when when actually as from our side of the fence we're there to enable people like you right to to understand those nuances to then allow you to relate that back to your business that you know more about them than potentially we do. Yeah, and I think you hit a, a good point there, Carl, really, because I dare say you might come across this quite often, and I certainly do. You see a lot more customers than I do, but quite often the customer doesn't seem to know what it wants. Um, they just want what's the you know what's the best technical solution, and you go you you started at chapter nine, and you need to start at chapter one, you know. Strip it back to its bare components. Too often people go, oh, we just want to upgrade what we've got, when in fact they've not even reevaluated whether or not what they've got is relevant or, and correct anymore. And it's best to strip it back. And you, sometimes you end up going, okay, we spent a bit of time evaluating what we used to do, evaluating what we could do, and decided actually we still need the same thing. That's fine. That's not time wasted. That's time coming to the right conclusions. But mm. too many times people want to skip chapters one to nine and just get on with the technical deployment to get their project finished as quick as possible. And it's not the right approach. You need to open as many doors as you possibly can. Otherwise, what you find with any project, you might run 20 projects. If they're all just upgrading and replacing the previous thing, well, in five years time, you will only have what you had five years prior. Yeah. Um, you know, by definition. So. Uh, as you say, it's really good. I think the, the value of someone like yourself is to come in independently. Sometimes that is needed, no matter how much someone like myself might badger on at a business or any part of the business that we need to reevaluate something. It's great if it comes in independently uh, with someone who specializes in a certain area and says, right, okay, this is the methodical approach we're going to apply. The first question I'm going to surprise you with is, do you even know what you want? Let's let's discuss it. You know, let's capture the requirements. Let's capture where your business is going and all the things that are falling short. Mm. So that, that's what I like from bringing in someone that, like yourself, actually, just that independent head. Yeah, and it's, it's very common, right? And you would have seen this as well in, in some situations on, on Twitter and things, right, where people are complaining about Citrix environments underperforming, Windows 10 eating up more resource and all that kind of thing, right? And the question is, well, did you ever understand what the resource consumption would look like? I don't want to use the word assessment, but understand, right? Do you understand what that resource footprint looks like? Yeah. If you're going to skip that understand phase and go straight into design and build, there's an element of risk. And do you know what? That risk might be acceptable. Yeah. 
or it might not. <laughs> and it's, yeah. far, it's far too often that people accept that risk and then they come back and they go, well, it doesn't work. And it's all, it does, it's just not sized properly. Yeah. As, just as, know, a, as a one example. Yeah, exactly. And, and you know, if you can, certainly if you're going to, if that business is going to have to lay out some cost that it wasn't expecting, it's nice to have data-driven um, uh, justification for that and go, well, we've proved you need it. Um, and if you don't have to have it, but there will be a consequence to that. And it's mm. when you de- when you can illustrate that in a in a non whizzy science way in just layman's terms, that I think solidifies that argument for the business quite well. And people are generally quite reluctant to put their name on a big decision against something that's evidenced um, and methodical. You know, um, it, it's like it's like that question. Would you like security? When do you ever get a no to that question? So, um, yeah, it's it's nice to have the evidence rather than hearsay about something being required. Yeah, the, the usual question after that is, is, what budget have you got aligned to security? Zero. <laughs> <laughs> Zero. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, funny, slightly different, getting onto a different question, of course, but one of the interesting points about that is, I've been in many meetings where businesses do seek so how much is it going to cost us to be secure and i said and i always say it's complete fallacy i can ensure you against greater and greater risk you cannot be full stop 100 percent secure you know there is no organization on the planet that cannot can sit here point blank having spent as many millions or billions as they wish and say we are undoubtedly unhackable and secure that's just nonsense yeah, well, the first, the first challenge, right, is the the, the the weakest link in the chain is people. Exactly. Always even more so in the current pandemic, right, where those people are at an end of a wire in an untrusted environment. You don't know who's behind them, who's at their end point, who's gotten held to, to ransom to a degree, right, all that kind of stuff, yeah. essentially. You just don't know. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, weakest link is always people. And I think a lot of customers that I speak to from a security perspective is that, oh, yeah, we've got fantastic perimeter firewalls. Fantastic. Awesome. What about your issue inside? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's yesterday's style, isn't it? Yeah, definitely. So um, what would you say is the most memorable moment so far in your career? The most memorable moment in my career? Oh, that's a tricky one. Most memorable, I mean, memorable in good and bad ways. I mean, I've been through a lot of mergers and acquisitions and they've been memorable for the wrong reasons. I think when in my younger years, um, that was a fearful thing to enter when you went into a merger, knowing there was uh, redundancies 12 months down the road after integration was complete, things like that. And I'm way past that point now. Too experienced, too old in my head. Don't really, not that I don't care about my role, but I, I, everything I can do about surviving a process like that, I will always do, even when there isn't a merger and an acquisition. So whatever is going to happen is going to happen. And, and I, one of the things I've always realised from many, many years of seeing myself and other people go through challenges is um, it's the fear of the unknown um, that scares people. But around the corner, there's always a new exciting challenge somewhere. Yeah. So it doesn't, that doesn't scare me. So that's one memory in particular of going through that. I've been lucky that I've never actually been made redundant. Uh, but going through a number of mergers and acquisitions that, for the early years was quite stressful. The other, um, one of the things I was quite proud of uh, was when I came to my current employer, um, there was a bit of chaos, should I say, in, in the infrastructure and things like that, and things needed sorted out. And I, I went to it, put a methodical approach on it, built a plan, built a roadmap, implemented a lot, of, large chunk of it quite soon. And within two years, I was made director um, as a recognition where some people have been there for 20 years plus and not had that privilege, which I was really proud of actually, is to go in there and, and know that I had actually, and that's why I actually quite like to work for a smaller business, mm. not in terms of 10 people, but I don't like necessarily to work for a business with 50,000 employees where your engineer 622. <laughs> I like the opportunity to stand out because I have the confidence in my ability to do so. Yeah. So, um, yeah, that's one aspect, I suppose, that uh, is particularly memorable. Yeah, cool. And 
What do you say is the biggest mistake you made and the lesson you learned from it? Well, I've had a, I remember sitting in a server room one day back in the old ProLine 3000 days um, when they had mechanical switches on them before they had the uh, electrical switches on them. And I went in to do some work on a server to decommission a server, went to power it off, but realized I'd pressed the, uh, the power switch on the PDC, the domain. And I sat there for about half an hour holding this switch in, which was spring loaded, thinking, I am not sure what happens if I quickly let go and put this back in. Do I sit here until six o'clock when everyone goes home? Or do, or do I just um, go for it? And after about half an hour, because it was like mid-afternoon, I just went for it. And I very quickly learned the spring-loaded mechanism on a mechanical ProLite 3000 will give you some time to put that power switch back on. So, I mean, it, it didn't have big consequences, but I remember sitting there quite worried about it at the time. Yeah, definitely. Um, yeah. And I used to work with a guy at Enterprise PLC in... in he was a bit of a joker, but he, he did something very similar, right? And then he sat there and he went, oh, no, I've bought a server that's only got one power supply. I wonder if I'm faster than electricity. <laughs> and he was like trying to, <laughs> trying to swap it over. It's like epic failure, as you'd expect. One of the, I mean, I didn't do this one, so this is, this is slightly cheating a little bit. One, one of my colleagues, my boss at the time, back, this is Exchange 5.5, five, I think it was, um, and he was doing a tape restore for, for a mailbox, and we didn't have bricked backups back then. It was just a full database restore, and he pressed, typed in the name of the uh, restore server, which was the name of the production server, and pressed enter. And the second he pressed enter, it went boom, down. <laughs> so we lost a day's work there and had to do a very political um, apology, going around, walking around the office and apologising for that. But that's cheating slightly. I didn't actually press the multi button on that one. Yeah, I think th th those kind of things happen though in everyone's career where you you, you literally, I, mean, I was giving this example the other, the other day on another session where when I was doing internal IT and I was running a Citrix environment and I was in the CMC and I put in my latest package to be pushed out from a Citrix upgrade perspective. And I've done this hundreds of thousands of times over a seven year period, right? But for some reason, I completely forgot about the 24 hour clock. <laughs> and rather than putting 2100 i put 0900 and right. pressed okay and then disappeared i went and got breakfast or whatever it was i was doing yeah and then obviously uh, the entire citrix environment for 12,000 concurrent users started to power down and uh people came running into the canteen while i'm eating my my poached egg on toast feeling very happy with myself and then they're like what have you done and i'm like no idea so i've left my food which was extremely upsetting for me um and then went to my desk and looked at it and went oh no do i own up to this or do i lie about it so i remember going to the infrastructure manager at the time and saying this citrix problem we've got i found the problem he went great can you fix it? and i went yeah it'll be sorted in an hour yeah and he was like what's wrong and i went i forgot about 24 hour clock <laughs> and he just looked at me and he went you're an absolute moron <laughs> <laughs> but to be fair it was it, it, it went down and it came back up and everything was fine and if anything um what the business learned was that people could actually sort of, could actually handle an hour's worth of downtime, which was something they were always worried that they couldn't do. <laughs> yeah, I think, you know, I think everyone's been in that situation where something, as you say, you've done something a hundred times and time 101, you've just you know, done it in the wrong way or the wrong tick box and it goes wrong. And I mean, there are places I've been to where that is borderline sackable offence in almost instantly and in sort of that sort of high pressure broken environment, certainly for trading applications, things like that, because there's so, so much consequence to it. But the vast majority of places I've been to, good managers not protect in, in, a, in a sort of hide it attitude, but they will defend you and go, look, this guy's done 50,000 things for me in the last 10 years. If he's mucked up once, I'm not putting him over the coals. It's just one of those things, and we'll have to get through it. No, uh, I think it's, um, it's picking up on the thing of empathy. Way, right? it's supported, right? Yeah, I think picking on the thing of empathy. Um, you mm -hmm. never know what's happening to that individual in the background, who at home, and all that kind of stuff. Oh, and it, yes. there might be something playing on that person's mind that's completely thrown them off what their their A game would normally look like as well. And that is one one lesson I would say to people is, you will undoubtedly come across situations where other people cock up. 
And my advice to you is give them some space and don't take your opportunity to dig them out. Mm. Because one day, I promise you, it will be you. And those individuals that you've supported and given some uh, support and, and slack to, um, you'll find they're suddenly your friends backing you at that moment when you need it. Whereas if you've dug them out and you're one of these people that points fingers and has a laugh and makes it as public as possible, you're going to probably find yourself on your own at some yeah. point. Because we all do it. I don't know anyone that hasn't. Yeah, exactly. And it's something we have picked up on these sessions that everyone's made plenty of mistakes, which is why I asked that question, because it's, it's yeah. worth letting people to know that mistakes are fine as long as you learn yeah. from it. If I did that 2100, 900 mistake two, three, four, five times and didn't learn from that mistake, then I deserve everything I get. Yeah. Um, but you've got That's to learn from the mistake. Thing. Learn your lessons. Definitely learn your lessons. Yeah. Yeah. So... Why, why did you get into the tech? And so we talked about you were doing reconciliation and those kind of things. And that, that, that trader, I think you said, pushed you into going for that support role. Yeah. But what, what kind of made you think, actually, that's, that's, that's worth a go? Well, I actually quite, I really enjoyed it. I, as I said to you earlier, like when, it, when I was talking about in, getting engaged with people just being in desktop support, for instance, that personal touch, making a difference, making someone, even if they were a bit upset at the time, making a difference and actually knowing that when you walked away, even under bated breath, they were probably going, actually, he's all right, done a good job there. Yeah. I like it. And, it, you know, it goes back to, I used to have a job at Tesco's and it was no different. I used to work on the tills and I loved having my customers. I had some customers that would come to my till because it was me, because they enjoyed the chat and the banter and giving them service, taking their bags out to their car, you know, just, and I've always loved doing that, making a difference. So when... When I got into IT, obviously your learning curve in the first couple of years is through the roof. And yes, you can keep that sort of trajectory because there's obviously so much tech that comes out these days. But I don't think you learn as much so quickly as you do in your first couple of years. I mean, you, yeah. you dip your toe in the water. You think you're a bit clever on IT if you come from that background. And you suddenly learn an awful lot about how business and the business and IT work together the processes the people the management of it all those things so I really enjoyed that learning curve um, at the time it was a very financially rewarding um, early pro career progression I you know you know again generally speaking most people in those first five years as you get from that apprentice level into five years experience your salary is going up quite quickly um, in in the year 2000 I had five job offers in a week. I went for six interviews and I had five offers. They were literally just fall, falling. And it was just because technology was booming. The 2000s, year 2000 stuff was quite big at the time. Um, and I wasn't asking for a lot of money, you know, a lot of money in today's terms. Um, so people were jumping at people like myself with a bit of experience. Again, that's, a, that's quite a big boost for someone who's doing something that you enjoy and there's jobs everywhere and you're getting reasonable pay for it and things like that so once I got into um, the money brokers that's where the game changed for me a little bit because over the call I was there 15 years and it was not all positive not at all but we if you can cut your mustard in an environment like I worked in for 15 years you can do it anywhere Hmm. we as a team had we had some fantastic individuals like a great team and we knew that they got their value out of us big time we were rock solid as a team pumping out huge amounts of work high pressure work as well and that again Matt, at the time when you're doing some of this stuff and you're under the cosh it's like it can be quite sort of agitating hmm. but after the event huge reward because you think i've done that no matter what i coped with that i've done it yeah, definitely. And I think some of my most memorable moments are when under pressure and when, when everyone's expectation is that you're going to fail, right? And you can come out of it and go, we did it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And it, that's, I would, I would urge someone never to try and find an easy job. So, you know, and there's different forms of an easy job, remember? I mean, where I work today, uh, the pressure is far reduced compared with what I used to. The management support and business support is 
far superior. Um, there's no finger pointing. It's all supportive. It's not all perfect, but you get so much support. And the ethos is work-life balance. Is mm. everyone okay? I think that's good. Overall, generally, that's quite a modern approach anyway, but yeah. my current employer is, has always been very good at that. Uh, whereas my previous employer, different bag, it was a case of sweat, 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 we don't care, keep going, keep going, keep going. And, and so... Sounds like a personal trainer. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> which I obviously haven't got any. Oh, me. <laughs> um, but the, the point being that when when you go through all of that experience and things like that you you will when i was those 15 years i was in my 20s and 30s so i could cope with that sort of bombardment bang 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 now i knew i was technically good enough as a team i had a great group of guys around me we were all supporting each other we got through it when i came to the end the natural end to that employment i realized i was like coming up for 40 years i was like i got a young family this is not the modus operandi that I want for the rest of my career. I've done that. I've got nothing to prove. I'm moving on. So, yes, I did take that transition into a less stressful position, not an easier position. It was just it was more rewarding in a different form because it was more methodical, more considered sort of uh, role. Hmm. Um, but, yeah, I think when you're young, if you're going to take those big challenges, that's the time to do it up until your thirties, you can go from challenge to challenge to challenge. Look, your learning curve will be through the roof. And then you can start start to focus on your career development a bit more. And if you, you know, if you want more money and more responsibility, go for that. But in the first five to 10 years, I would encourage, I would discourage people from focusing on that. Yeah. Yeah, definitely I'd agree with that. And if you're looking back at yourself when you were starting out and doing this kind of this this journey, what, what top three tips would you give yourself now looking back? Oh, good question. Uh, what top tips would I give myself? Um, have confidence. Um, I think in, you know, when, even when you first join any organisation, you go in, your confidence level goes down a little bit because no, no matter how sort of broad shoulders you've got, you walk into and you're like, I don't really know what this is like. I don't know what they're going to think of me, all those sort of things. But over time, I've realized that actually confidence is great um, because you can go into a business and they will get confidence from your confidence. Mm. So have opinions about things, but don't be set in your ways. Be adaptable, be flexible, be agile and be, be a great listener. I, you know, as much as I'm in technology, the first thing I want to do when I sit down and want to talk to the business people that aren't technical in that is I don't say anything. I just want to go, right, talk. I'll ask you some questions, but you talk. And once we've done the talking, then I'll start talking about technology to whatever level they want to go to. Hmm. So for me, listening and be em having empathy and understanding is a, a great advantage for anyone. Don't, focus on tiny little details it's not it's not what people want to talk about all the time people want to talk about bigger picture stuff from thirty thousand feet up they want people in the business want to know that you have considered right the way to the top of the business strategy before you've even come to them with a technical solution because it instantly tells them a lot about you yeah yeah i agree on those definitely and i think even at an early age in your career, right, when you're first starting out, if you can start getting into that mindset whilst you're learning the tools of the trade and the support roles and that kind of thinking, right, by resetting this person's password or changing that printer toner, yeah. what is that enabling from a business outcome perspective? And if you start just thinking at it from that level and then carry on going at that pace, when you get five, six years in and you've been doing that, you're going to be ready to go into a position where if you wanted to become a leader in your field or you wanted to specialise in an area, you know how to capture requirements, you know what the outcome is, and you know what yeah. you're ultimately trying to drive rather than Tanzu is the next best thing since sliced bread, but actually no one in our business is going to use it. As yeah, and it, 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 one of the things that I often see um, from, I'll put, them, I'll put a label on it, administrators more than technologists mm. really, is they'll soon 
pick a bit of technology or a, a system or something and they'll say we have put it in and they go this, this is rubbish this is rubbish is it why is it rubbish because it made my job a little bit more difficult i have to now tick this extra box or do this extra process and i always say to people right and what about the other 849 people in this business did it improve their their way of life and, and did it improve everything for them well yeah well there you go again where's your empathy where's your bigger picture stuff you know stop focusing on, on your little micro world and try and understand the bigger context you know yeah definitely and would you say there's any point in your career where you've sat there and thought right i'm gonna quit and then you've actually emotionally become strong and gone actually no i'm not i'm gonna work through this but is there, has that ever happened and, and how did you overcome it yeah i've had both if i'm honest um it's one of the lessons I would probably feed back to people is, you know, like I say, I do enjoy that challenge of turning people around and things like that. There have been one or two occasions in my career. I mean, there's been one occasion where I actually did lose it. Yeah. And I actually went to the degree of uh, just walking out and going home. And it's not the right approach, no matter what has kicked off. And I was quite lucky because the person who upset me, uh, I won't bore you with the details, but the person who upset me in, in a very, very big way over a pro prolonged period of time called me back in and said, like, don't resign, stay here, blah, blah, blah. And I did, but I could have easily just accepted it. And, I, and that would have been the end of that little career. And it's not the right approach. It's a big lesson I've learned. I, I don't do that anymore. I don't allow myself to get to that point. I was having a chat with Jack Tracy we had on another session and he was saying that when, when he comes home, he's very fortunate that his, his wife is definitely extremely in tune with his, with his uh, zen, shall we call it, right? And uh, if he comes home stressed or, or she can tell that he's angry or annoyed or whatever it might be, she literally becomes his agony aunt, right? And sits down and just absorbs and lets him rant at her. And then she'll pass him the pen and paper and go, let's, let's write down the pros and cons here and see what what we can do about it rather than yeah. being everyone when they're younger right everyone gets emotional when when, when they don't have to control those emotions especially when you go into business from being in the academia space potentially where emotions yeah. in the academia space were probably ignored in business it's not ignored and it's seen as is, is something that that could potentially limit someone's career potentially um, massively i mean and that, that's the key you can have you can people only remember the times when you lost it Right, when it comes in the context of this. So if you can sit there and bite your tongue, maybe for weeks and weeks, months and months and even years, that one time that you don't control it can be the undoing of you. It really can. So it's always best to always deal with a situation. Um, as, as you were just saying about um, the, the other guy you were talking about, when you've got things in front of you that need dealing with they're not generally don't go away on their own you need mm. to either kick them out in a non-aggressive way or you need to uh, adjust your mentality and thinking or processes to adapt to it because if you allow it to be it's a, it, let's let's be honest it's a bit like marriage right if you know as a husband and wife if you just let things build up at some point one of you is going to explode where it's just better just to get it out in the open or take take a different approach or whatever it is. You have to work at all things in life over a long period of time will be challenging. Mm. Even the most rewarding job that you can imagine, eventually you will start coming across challenges that don't sit comfortably with you. Yeah, definitely. So we move to some industry questions then, right? So um, obviously the industry's changed a lot since, since you started out. What would you say is the biggest change that's happened? The... the, uh, the Virtualization for me was the biggest change, um, even bigger than what I think the cloud is at the moment. Um, the cloud's probably getting there, but virtualization was just a game changer. I, I don't know of a IT guy in my area that the first time they saw it didn't go, bloody hell, mm. like, that's a game changer, you know, from racking and stacking one-to-one -one physical machines, server rooms full of hundreds and hundreds of unused kit to virtualization, where I can do this thing called a V-motion. Are you joking me? You know, um, that was just, a, 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 now it's just seen as 
it's just commodity. It's just like, yeah, well, everyone does that. But back then it was massive. And the other thing I would say is IT has gone from a toy the business business did not know it needed to mission critical in most organizations. So I remember when we first put our very first email server in and the vast majority of staff said, I have no idea why you're giving me this. I don't need it. I never will. I, and then you try to take an email away from someone now. And yeah, we're uh, all trying it, right? Let's get them yeah. into Teams and this and this and yeah. that. And it's like, don't go into email. Don't send that that all, yeah. all hands update message that you send out to a thousand people. Just do it as an announcement in Teams. Yeah, and yeah. still that email comes out. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and and pay, Look, I work for an organization where the the mean time of career at the current organization is very high. You know, there's people been there 25, 35, 45 years. Mm. They don't like change, a lot of these people. They're, they've been, you know, been following a process. You can often ask someone, why do you do this process? I don't know. Someone in 1992 told me I have to do it, and so I do it. And so if you try and change that process with a new technology, they go, you're, this is typical IT telling us what to do again. Blah, blah, blah. It's really difficult to change long bedded culture. It really is difficult. Um, so, but I, most of the time, when you force through change, people themselves don't realize how adaptable they are. They find that new process within six weeks, they've forgotten the previous thing they used to do and go, actually, this is a lot better. It's like this um, current situation we're in now, right, with this pandemic. So yeah. people have been forced to change the process and the way they work and, and yeah. they've had to adopt it or not have a job, ultimately. Yeah, I mean, um, you, try, you try and get this sort of concept through to almost any organisation. We want you to send everyone home to work and see, you know, see, how, see how rewarding aspects of that can be. You just get laughed out of the room. Now it's been enforced upon the business uh, people are going, actually, no, I don't think it's 100% what all businesses want. Our business still is a very social business and struggles mm. conceptually, this idea that people won't be back in the office. I don't think that will happen. I think we will largely get back in the office. But what it will do is demonstrate and prove irrefutably to a business that it can function with either some or a lot or all of people working from home. The world doesn't fall apart. The business operates. Yeah, definitely. On, on the pandemic, right, obviously there's positives and negatives to this entire situation that we're in. What would you say the, yeah. the, the positive and negative that you've seen from your side so far? The positive side, I would say, is it's opened doors to conversations about technology that if we tried to sell from the underside in IT would be, no, we don't need that, we don't want that. So um, once you get certain technology to assist the business in this area, they can suddenly start seeing the tangibility, no matter how many times. There are some times when you try and describe to a business what you're trying to achieve and people just don't get it. They don't see the relevance. They don't, they don't want to prioritize it. They've got other things on their mind. Whatever the reason is, they just don't want to take you down that road. And it's frustrating because you know it could be a leap forward. This is an example of where you can start to talk about disaster recovery and end user compute and uh, mobile working strategies and things like that and start to get budget for it. And it's not much different to when the NHS had their malware attack a few years back when suddenly you could walk into any boardroom, mention malware and security and your project would be signed off because everyone was too fearful to not sign it off. Even though people have been telling them about this stuff for many years. And it, it is a shame that sometimes the technology people require uh, that you're putting in is the technology that they needed yesterday. It's normally an event that is the trigger for change. And it's one of the things, that if we go back to what you, know, you were saying about what would I recommend to people, that's a great example of what I would say to someone. Don't be limited and by the constraints of what people keep telling you internally. Be it, be adventurous. Put it in business context. Don't sell a wet dream that's not relevant to a business, but put forward and demonstrate, actually demonstrate a technology or a solution or a way forward for a business yeah. and get this, get someone to sponsor that, that maybe you can get excited and get on board. Because if you get a C-level sponsor on any idea, um, you will open doors very quickly. And if you open doors 
and deliver something of tangible benefit to the business. And that may be financial, it may be strategic, it may be anything else. You will quickly get a name and recognition and then every subsequent project you put forward will gain more weight because people have confidence in you. Yeah, definitely. That, and that's from what I've seen, like from working with from the other side of the fence and being being ultimately on the sales side, like coming into internal organizations. And it's that you go in, you know, when you go into a room with someone and it's very cold and frosty because you're coming in to tell them how to do their jobs now, right? So the first yes. two or three workshops and sessions and things are, are not great, right? And then after a while, you then start throwing in these little nuggets of assistance and, oh, you tried that instead. It's not what we're looking at right now, but here's go and do this. Here's a, here's a YouTube video. Here's a Google link. Here's a, a friend on Twitter or whatever. Yeah. And then straight away, oh, this guy's actually here to help. He's not here to make me look daft or steal my job or whatever it might be. And then that way, the relationship starts to build. And then you get to a point where, where you're happy to bounce ideas off each other rather than sit there and see them as a competitor. Yeah, it must be a strange feeling to be asked to walk into an organisation only to be almost treated like foe from day one. Mm. When, you know, you go, well, you kind of asked me here to help you. Let's all get on board together and get on that journey together, you know, like really help each other out. Um, you know, and it's, if, if you're going to engage with someone else who's got a speciality that, you know, <laughs> the last thing you need is a team of people as you say with faces like thunder trying to basically trying to kick you out of the room um it's not constructive at all yeah definitely so is any um technology that's piquing your interest at the moment well there's several technologies are when it first came out not that we use it but i'm very excited about the likes of things like vmware on aws things like this about <laughs> to me that screamed of really what the conceptually about what the cloud is really about is about getting something that um, in a common platform it may be already in your organization and be able to consume it um, on an agile flexible basis in the cloud uh, when, when needed I, I just love that whole concept really I've never been a great flat fan of you know, your proprietary IaaS platforms in the public mm. cloud, that they're, they're not easy to manage and then generally not very easy to manage either. Um, so I, I like that con conceptually. WVD, of course, everyone's talking about at the moment. Uh, it's something that I've got my eyes on, maybe demonstrate to the business next year, um, just in terms of ease of, because let's face it, to, to do a true pilot, of a VDI environment in the old way of, you know, maybe having to have those, that fast spare kit to make it a good experience was potentially an expensive uh, thing to achieve. This sort of thing in the cloud is ideal. You know, you can lease it for a period of time. Um, and some of the, the, some of the um, innovations they're making are going in the right direction. It's not really fully there yet, but I like the, the way it's going. So I, I like the idea of being able to, use the cloud to be able to demonstrate technology to the business temporarily at minimal cost. Mm. That's good. RPA is something that we've looked at, but I do feel like RPA is a bit of a stopgap to true automation to me. Uh, RPA is normally based on chucking RPA modules on top of a legacy platform that we yeah. want to design properly. It's great as a stopgap. It can have huge return on investment in high transaction environments and things like this. But the danger, of course, is the business thinks it's dealt with that problem of the legacy just by sticking RPA on, RPA on top of something when, in essence, we really need to fix that problem in the system, lower level down than, than that. Yeah. And just overall, I think con the consumerization of technologies has been fantastic. The cloud has opened that door. Anyone, anywhere can have a Raspberry Pi, Raspberry Pi Internet of Things, little play around with that anything at all um uh, microsoft logic apps for instance and all, all the power automation i think they call it now mm -hmm. all these things are consumerizing things that normally you needed a geek for uh, and and that's great because that just breeds innovation you can you can have your 16 year old or a 14 year old in a room creating funky little technology 
which can and eventually be relevant to a business. This is, this is why I think Microsoft has, has, has really looked into the future, right? Around that whole citizen app dev scenario, putting the power into the hands of the users. And people sit there going, well, my users aren't intelligent enough. The users you have now are intelligent enough. They just don't want to do it. But the users you're going to have in, or your service consumers really rather than users, um, that you're going to have in four or five years time, they're going to be a hell of a lot more technically savvy. And they're going to want this kind of stuff because they're going to have had it in university and college and all those, or at home and whatever else. So that they're a little bit more in tune to what they want rather than what they're given. Um, and I think that's for me, where Microsoft have looked forward and gone, let's make something that is great for people that have minimal technical knowledge, so low code, no code scenarios, yeah. but then also allow people that can code to bolt their stuff on top and make these, these glorious yeah. platforms and productivity tool sets that, we can't build ourselves because it's very specific to a, a process flow or a, or a business. Well, it takes me back to the days when I was learning Excel and I'd record a macro. I didn't need to be a programmer. Yeah. But I could, you know, it'd be very lazy and very heavy handed programming behind the scenes. But I could record a macro and it would repeat it for me, the whole process. And, and that, you know, in essence, was actually where I learned some of my programming as well, was to go into that code and start ripping it apart. But the, the point is that consumers can start doing things without necessarily having those low-level skills. It's almost like manufacturing and things like that, you know. Once things happen at scale, innovation comes forward and so does efficiency. Um, and actually, slightly going back, actually, onto, this reminds me a little bit, the point you were making about the current situation and what opportunities it's done. One of the things I think I'm observing at the moment is how businesses, some are fighting the remote working and some are actually using it as an opportunity to gain some strategic benefit. And by that I mean, I don't know many university students at the minute, graduates coming out and asking, can I please come to the office, please? Mm -hmm. You know, most people that are um, uh, talented, leaving university, things like this, um, from around the world, are, are going to want to do and can do remote working for your organisation. If an organisation wants to employ or encourage a young breed of talent, which I know many do, um, you've got to adapt for that world, not the world that you're used to. So instead of trying to get your talent from the commuter belt, you can get your talent from anywhere you want. You know, mm -hmm. if you're willing to use that to, to just a, a, take on board that COVID situation, that remote working situation, say, well, it's here whether we like it or not. Let's see what we can get out of it as a business. Let's use it as an opportunity Every business in the world, anything, if it fights a situation it can't win, will generally go, will lose. It will lose that battle. So you might as well use the best of every situation you possibly can. If there's a recession, you use the best, you know, remodel your business for that recession. And it's no different in terms of encouraging good, young, talented people that honestly, probably many of which do not want to come into a nine to five office job. Yeah, well, maybe one day a week for a bit of social and then the rest of it yeah. remote, right? So and that's, yeah. and that's one of the things for me personally is I I can work from home if I so wish to do so um, throughout most of the year. Most of my times with customers, right? So I'm always out and about anyway, but I still go to the office one day a week. Well, not now, but when before the uh, pandemic hit because for me, that was the water cooler conversations, the relationship building, the rapport building because rapport is built over your first 90 seconds of engagement as an example, rather than these things that blur some of that, that non-spoken language of yeah. posture and, and uh, the, the tone of voice gets lost a little bit sometimes over audio on these you things. You can't see all my finger movements under the table. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You can't see, you can't kick someone under the table to stop them from talking <laughs> and things like that. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's, it's been an interesting eight months, nine months right of this situation. But I think... I think people have adapted fairly well in general. Yes, I do. Um, so if we, if we think about some lightning questions, right? So some quick answers around some of the topics that, that get us to know a bit about Darren. Okay, I'll try. <laughs> uh, last technology purchase? My personal one. Yeah. Uh, Blink security system. 
Nice. Okay. Uh, biggest inspiration? Uh, two people. My dad, who I unfortunately lost recently, and um, Peter Gabriel, musician. Oh, nice. Okay. Uh, what does work-life balance mean to you? Um, making sure I'm able to enjoy my life with my family and friends to the point that they don't notice I work. Then I know I've got the balance right. I, I, I always do that. I won't yeah, carry on quick fire. <laughs> yeah, no, it's great, man. Honestly, I think there's a lot of people that that, that live to work rather than work to live. Yeah, and I, I think my, the essence of my belief these days is I only ever, you know, as much as I like my employer and getting paid and things like that, I only ever, ever went to work because I needed to financially. Mm. If I could stop tomorrow and do something else more interesting, I, you know, than going into an office, I would. That, no one should kid themselves about that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, what did you want to do when you finished school? I had absolutely no idea. Not a clue. That's true. <laughs> what did you want to be when you were a child? An astronaut? <laughs> well, I wanted to be a pilot like most little boys do until I realised I was scared to be 10 foot off the ground. <laughs> and I didn't do roller coasters. So those two <laughs> things meant I probably wasn't the perfect candidate. Pro probably not, mate, no. no. Um, what is your favourite book? Uh, I don't do a lot of fiction. So my favourite book is actually a book called Harry's War. I love I love real people's stories. And I don't mean cheap biographies about uh, someone with a big bum or something like that. I mean, someone who can bring some rea history and reality to life. And Harry's War is just a brilliant book. Yeah, great. And most important thing to you is? Family and friends. Ne never work. Always family and friends first. If you had words of wisdom that was going to go into a tweet, what would you say? I'd quote uh, one of my favourite songs, um, which has got a lot of meaning behind the phrase beyond the few words that it is, which is build a rocket boys. Yeah. Uh, favorite song. Favorite song. Oh, that's a good question. Um, I'm going to go a bit old school now. People are going to wonder, wonder where the hell did you dig this bloke up from? Um, a song called Afterglow by Genesis in 1970s. <laughs> yeah, nice, nice song. Uh, fill in the blank. The new normal is? I'm working. <laughs> I'm working. It is indeed. Um, must watch TV show. It's actually a game show. Uh, me and the missus often watch Richard Osman's House of Games, which I think is brilliant. Okay, not seen that. I'll have, to have a look out for that one. <laughs> uh, and favourite junk food? Oh, favourite junk food. At the minute, Turkish. So, barley, rice, uh, kebab, love it. Yeah, definitely. I think on that note, I think it's time to go and grab some food because it's late into the evening. So thank <laughs> yeah. you very much for your time. It's been great. And I hope that the audience has taken something away from this session.